Gentlemen, if you'd remove your hats and uh, if we could all bow our heads for prayer. Most gracious Father, we thank you for this day of celebration. We are grateful for your goodness and your provision, and we look forward with excitement to what you have planned for these young people who are graduating and moving forward in the world. Father, we pray that your blessing would be on them, that they would honor you with the decisions they make, that uh, although the path may not be easy, um, it would be sweet because of your presence. Father, we now commit this time of celebration to you, and we ask that you would be present with us, and we pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe you may be seated. Aloha ke akua, which means welcome in the name of the Lord. Benvenue, welcome. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you to the Valley Forge Christian College, excuse me, graduation of 2012. <clears throat> To our VFCC family and friends, we welcome you to celebrate this prestigious and extremely sacred moment. You made it. <laughs> to the graduates, well done. You've crossed the finish line. But may I tell you that that finish line is merely a starting point for another finish line to come. Congratulations and welcome to this prestigious and exciting event. To the families, you did it. You stood behind the individual that you have held in your hands, held up in prayer, held up in finances. Welcome. And to the administration, faculty, and staff, one more down, a whole lot more to go. <laughs> welcome. And especially welcome to the Lord Jesus, our Savior. We welcome him here today. We want his presence. We desire his presence. For this is the day that the Lord has made. And graduates of 2012, this is your day. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I want to invite you to stand. Today is a great day. Today is a really exciting day. For those of us that are graduating, it means a new chapter in our lives is about to begin, and a wonderful chapter has come to a close. For some of us, we know what we're doing. Some of us, we don't. But either way, we want to give glory and praise to our King this morning. This is a great, exciting day. Let's dedicate this time of worship to Him. It's a great way to begin a wonderful day of graduation. Pray, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this great day. We celebrate your presence. Ask that you would be glorified in you. Be glorified in this place and be with us this morning. We worship you and praise you. Your wonderful name we ask. Amen. Let's sing together. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things. Because it's you who gives me strength. Nothing is impossible.
Let the name of Jesus forever be glorified. We are alive in you. We are alive in you.
thank you for your presence in this place and for blessing us this morning. We ask that you would be with us through the day and keep the rain away. <laughs> and we ask that you would just make this graduation who we want to remember. We thank you, Father God, for all you've been for us thus far. And we trust in your unfailing love that you will continue to be faithful. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. You may be seated. At this time, we have a special presentation. We are concluding the inaugural year of the Deaf Pastoral Studies Program at Valley Forge Christian College. At this time, the students in the program wish to make a special presentation to those who have been so significant in providing leadership for this program. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Joanne Smith, Dr. Lottie Rikahoff, Linda Martin, and Deanne and Matt to please come to the platform and also Dr. Meyer if you would join with us. speak first hello family and friends thank you for coming today we appreciate you celebrating with us and we wanted to celebrate this occasion of the uh, inauguration of the deaf program here at VFCC and as it moves forward this was a significant year um, Matt and myself are the first deaf graduates of VFCC, and we are so grateful to Valley Forge <laughs> Christian College for allowing this program to even happen. It's been awesome, and we look forward, Matt and I both, look forward to the future where we will see more and more deaf people coming into the program, and it will just explode. Matthew and I, really want to thank especially Dr. Myers, the president of Valley Forge Christian College, and Dr. Joanne Smith for making this beginning possible. And of course, we couldn't have done it without Lottie and uh, Sister Lottie and Sister Linda, and for their gift as well, and the, uh, Dr. McLeod and the, um, all of the faculty, the staff, the administration, everything had worked just right for this to happen, it has been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so now we simply want to express our appreciation and pray for the future of the program as it moves forward. In the book of Joel, it says we move forward. And so we um, um, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you immensely to all of you. I just asked Dr. Smith if she wanted to say a word, and she did. She said no. <laughs> On behalf of uh, all of the family of Valley Forge Christian College, 
We are deeply grateful for such a gracious expression of appreciation. Uh, we are thankful for this inaugural year. Our lives have been enormously enriched by these incredible four students, two of whom will be graduating today. And uh, I can't wait for this afternoon to shake their hands and to congratulate them as their tools are now sharpened and their toolbox is filled to go change the world. And we are so blessed, uh, Deanne and Matt, to have you, but we'll reserve our congratulations until this afternoon. Thank you, and also Dr. Rika Hoff and Linda Martin, we are just indescribably grateful for your generosity to invest in the next generation of leaders within the deaf community and beyond to be part of this initiative to make this possible. And of course, with financial help, with students, none of it would be possible without the leadership of uh, Dr. Smith, Joanne Smith, and the expertise that she and other faculty who are part of the training of our students as well. So we're so thankful to have you here as well. Thank you, God bless you. The year 2000 marked the beginning of a tradition at VFCC. The senior class advisor and two students are selected by the faculty to speak at the baccalaureate service. This is a worthy tradition that we are following for 2012 as well. Another tra tradition that began in 2008 is that the music department selects graduating seniors to present musical selections. And just last year, the selection of a graduating senior worship team was established. Today, worship was led by Isaac Brooks, Chanel Chavers, Brooke Coyne, Devin Curry, Liana Henry, Sean Noble, Josh Rosenberger, Andrew Steinbach, Heather Tw Twiss, and Andrew Young. It's now my privilege to introduce the speakers and musicians for the 2012 baccalaureate service. I am going to introduce all five first, so I will read their introductions and then they will come and present without any further introduction. Isaac Brooks, cellist. Isaac was born in Corvallis, Oregon. In the fifth grade, he started private cello lessons. During his middle school years, his family relocated to Meridian, Idaho. While in high school, Isaac was a sectional cellist of the Meridian Youth Symphony Orchestra, the Idaho Choral Symphony Orchestra, and the Music Theater of Idaho. <clears throat> During his time in Idaho, he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. It was then that he found a profound longing to worship God with the cello. Through his church in Idaho, Meridian Assembly of God, Isaac had the opportunity to compete in national fine arts competition in Indianapolis. During this time, he auditioned for the Valley Forge Christian College and became the recipient of the Virtuoso Award. Isaac had the privilege of traveling for one year with Chosen. He is regularly requested to perform sacred and classical works with, within the local Philadelphia church community. Isaac is graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in Music Performance in the Violin Cello. Upon graduation, Isaac plans to further his career by pursuing a master's degree in orchestra performance and instrumental pedagogy. Chanel Chavers, vocalist. Chanel was born in Buffalo, New York. She attended the Amherst School District where she sang in the Concert Chorale and student-led Sweet Sixteen's female vocal group. She also participated in New York State School Music Association and sang in the All-State Women's Choir. While attending the Expressway Assembly of God, Chanel participated in missionettes where she was crowned an honor star. She sang on the church worship team and competed in fine arts. At VFCC, Chanel has been a member of the Concert Choir and the Honors Italian Study Tour allowing her to go on missions trips to Italy in March 2010 and 2012. She also toured with Chosen throughout the 2010 and 11 years and had the privilege of leading the team for the 2011-12 year. Chanel will graduate with a Bachelor of Music in Music Performance and a minor in Church Music. After graduation, she will continue to sing and travel. She will also lead worship at her home church in Buffalo. Marissa Shade speaker. Marissa Shade was born and raised in Cumberland, Maryland. She is the big sister of four brothers. When Marissa was asked to share about herself, she talked more about her family than herself. 
Their love and support has been instrumental to her success. While at VFCC, Marissa served as a start team leader, executive student leader of Community Service Day, student representative of the Academic Affairs Committee, resident assistant and president of the American Association of Christian Counselors. She was one of four students selected to represent VFCC at the National Conference on Ethics in America and was a student representative for Community Service Day, submitting a grant proposal to supplement funding through corporate support. Marissa also traveled to Italy this spring with the Honors Study Tour. She will graduate with a Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Counseling. She plans to continue her education in marriage and family therapy. Until then, she plans to work full time, gain valuable life experience, and ministry is also another passion of hers, being heavily involved in church after graduation is a priority. Devin Curry, speaker. Devin was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts and grew up in Palmer, Massachusetts. In high school, he was involved in student government and drama. He has attended Evangel Assembly of God in Wilbraham for most of his life and has been involved in many areas, including church worship teams, drama, youth group leadership. During three of his four years at VFCC, Devin has worked as an audio technician. He also was a member of NUMA for the past two years, serving as the audio tech one year and guitarist the other. Devin will graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. <clears throat> Upon graduating, he plans to move back to Massachusetts and seek employment in the mental health field. He will marry Ashton Collins next summer, an early childhood education major here at Valley Forge. Devin plans to pursue a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. Professor Philip Baker, senior class advisor. Pro Professor Baker has served and inspired the emerging generations for the past 25 years in many different venues. From helping out the youth at a small community church even before he graduated from North Central University to full-time positions in large and influential churches, to being a professor and developer of the Youth Studies program at Valley Forge Christian College since 2004. Phil and his wife Beth have been married for more than 25 years. They are the proud parents of four children who are in high school and college, pursuing lives of tremendous passion and purpose. Thank you.
Good morning. How is everybody doing? <laughs> wow, there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, we would like to say that it is an honor and privilege to share our hearts with you this morning. Words cannot express the importance of this day. just so full of emotions, you know, just me. <laughs> Words cannot express the importance of this day and what it signifies for each and every one of us. Before we begin, I want to thank the administration, the board, and the faculty members for giving us this opportunity. On behalf of all the graduates, we also want to thank all of you who have come to join us on this very special day. It is our hope today, as we examine our lives in light of a familiar individual from the Bible, we would be inspired to stand in awe of the one who forgives yesterday's painful regrets, the one who frees us from today's pathetic excuses, and the one who is always faithful in the midst of the paralyzing fears of the future.
Who is this? A familiar individual from the Bible, you may ask? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> he is known to many as the liberator, the leader, the lawgiver, the prophet, and the historian. We know him simply as Moses. This was the man called to free the Israelites from the Egyptian oppression, the man who parted the Red Sea, the man who received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. We know him as a great leader. But to our surprise, this great leader also had rough beginnings, which led him to regret. In Exodus 2, verses 1 through 15, Moses' story begins. We learn that during the time that Moses was born, Pharaoh ordered all newborn Hebrew boys to be killed. Moses' mother obviously did not want this to happen to her son, so she put him in a basket and placed him among the reeds by the riverbank to hide him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh had come down to the river to bathe and noticed this basket. She opened the basket and saw that it was a Hebrew child and decided to keep him and raise him as her own. Ever since then, Moses was raised up to be a prince of Egypt. Yet, somewhere along the line, Moses became aware of his Hebrew descent. We read in verses 11 through 15 that one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrew men were struggling together. And he said to the man in wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. It is evident that Moses' beginning life can be summarized with three main regrets. Regret one, the loss of his identity. Since birth, Moses was unable to fully embrace who he truly was, a Hebrew. Moses was ultimately living a lie, whether he was aware of it or not. He was an Israelite, but lived as a prince of Egypt. Looking out towards his suffering people while he received the royal treatment, Moses could have asked many questions and even possibly regretted his spared life. Regret two, his way versus God's way. Moses showed that he was willing to identify with God's people and defend the Hebrews through his act of murder. However, this drastic and impulsive act also demonstrated that Moses took matters into his own hands instead of submitting to God's methods and God's perfect timing. And regret three, being misunderstood. We read that the Hebrew man in verse 14 questioned Moses' motives. The Hebrew man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? the fellow countrymen clearly misunderstood Moses' help. Unfortunately, this happens time and time again to Moses, even after his encounter at the burning bush. No one fully understand his calling to lead Israel out of captivity and into deliverance. So, as we reflect on Moses' life and on his past, we can see his regrets. And this can remind us of our own regrets of our pasts. In my own life, I have had personal regrets. And no, I did not kill anyone. That would be bad. Marissa Shade, the 2012 baccalaureate speaker, the mass murderer. Yeah. No, that's not me. <laughs> no, I have different regrets in different ways. Um, my main regret stemmed from transparency and learning what that genuinely looked like. If you have not guessed yet, yes, I struggle with perfectionism. Those of you who know me well can verify that with an amen. amen. <laughs> Honestly, though, this struggle with perfectionism has taken over my life, had taken over my life to the very core. Because of the image of perfectionism that I was trying to maintain in every area of my life, I was unable to be fully transparent. 
in those moments that I needed to be and most desperately wanted to be. I realized I didn't even know how to be. At one point, I remember getting so deep within my sin and despair, and I remember calling out to God, asking, how? How did I get to this point? I see no way out, Lord. Lord, please, please help me out. And for the first time, I saw the significance and the importance of transparency. Transparency not only with myself, but with God and with others around me, my family, with my friends. God used transparency as a vehicle that was moving me towards forgiveness and that would ultimately break the regrets of my past. Despite Moses' regrets, despite my regrets, and despite your regrets, there is forgiveness. We will see in Moses' call at the burning bush that God overcame his identity crisis. God overcame his self-reliance and his self-methods. God overcame his misunderstandings by his peers and family and brought forgiveness and restoration to Moses' life. His birth, his rescue from death, and all the events of his youth, including his regrets, were under the care and the direction of God so that Moses would be prepared to lead Israel out of captivity. We must realize that God often works in ways we might not understand or take us through painful circumstances that shake our very being. But we can be confident that he knows what is best for us. He will accomplish his purposes in our lives if we continue to seek him and embrace the power of forgiveness that ultimately leads us to the road of restoration. God said, Moses, I know your background, and I have forgiven you anyway. God said, Marissa, I know your imperfections, but I have forgiven you anyway. And God said, class, graduating class of 2012, I know your backgrounds, I know your imperfections, and I know your regrets, but I forgive you anyway. Thank you. Good morning. In Exodus chapter 3, we pick up Moses' life, and we find him at the encounter between he and God at the burning bush. God has recognized that the people of Israel are stuck in slavery in Egypt and are suffering. He speaks to Moses through this burning bush and tells Moses of his intentions to send Moses to the leader of Egypt in order to pull the Israelites out of Egypt. Before Moses jumps at this opportunity, he has a couple questions and concerns. And Starting off, the first couple questions, they seem pretty legitimate to me. We're going to start with chapter 3, verse 11 in Exodus. Question number one, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God answers, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So Moses has another question. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God answers, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. At this point, God goes on to tell him to assemble the elders of Israel together and tell them of his promise to bring them out of Egypt. He assures Moses that they will listen and believe him. He basically lays out his whole plan on how he is going to release the Israelites from Egypt. Now, you would think at this point, Moses is satisfied and ready to go. Well, not quite. In chapter 4, we find Moses with another question. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Now, at this point, it's becoming quite clear to me that Moses is not totally buying into this mission. God has just assured him that the elders will believe in him and has basically given him a spoiler on how the situation will unfold with the Egyptians. Yet Moses begins with a what-if scenario. Don't you think God has already thought about already the, all the what-ifs? In order to strengthen Moses' faith, God proceeded to go beyond the verbal and show Moses a few physical signs. God proceeds to turn Moses' staff into a snake, Moses' hand leprous in healing it, and then turns water into blood. God explains, if they do not believe you or pay any attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. 
But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. So now, let's look back real quick. Moses has God's reassurance. He has God right at his side. And he has three miracles to work with. That's a pretty good arsenal. However, he's still hesitant. Moses says to him, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And God answers, who gave human beings their mouth? Who, gave, who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Now at this point, Moses has run out of excuses. He's thrown everything out there and God has completely smacked it back in his face and giving him an overwhelming answer. And in verse 10 of chapter 4, Moses says, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. When God answered all of his excuses, Moses' Moses's hidden motives were revealed. I do believe Moses wanted to join God in his work. He just couldn't get to the point where he could believe that God could make it work through him. Unfortunately, this type of situation can arise in our lives as well. Until last spring, I was a youth ministry major. Although I didn't believe my views on my calling to be totally off, I did believe that I was being directed to a new path, which was psychology. The more I thought about it and prayed about it, the more clear it became to me that this was God's way of directing me to go there. However, immediately, as soon as those thoughts came to my mind, excuses came to my mind, such as it's too late in my college career to switch majors. I don't really know much about psychology. The expectations surrounding me are that I will go into the ministry. I've heard Dr. Skofor was pretty intimidating. These excuses just piled up and piled up. And, but just as this was with Moses, every excuse was met with an answer, proving my excuse wrong. Eventually, I had to trust that God knew what was best, better than I did. Without him, I would never have been able to switch majors, take all my necessary classes, and complete an internship in the past three semesters. The point is here, not what I'm able to accomplish and not what we're able to accomplish on our own. The point is that if we let go of our excuses, we are free to live in God's will. Our own excuses can often restrict us and hold us back from what God wants for our lives. But when we let go of our excuses and have faith that God will be with us, that he will go before us, and that he has already thought about all the what-if scenarios in our lives, we are free to live in his will and free to live out his plan for us. When we go out from this place, there will be incredible opportunities that come our way. The question is, will we come up with our excuses and let them hold us back from possible life-changing experiences or live in the freedom that being in God's will brings? My hope for myself and all of you, class of 2012, is that we choose freedom. Thank you. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The regrets of yesterday covered by forgiveness. The excuses of today covered by freedom. And I'm here to talk about tomorrow. God has called this senior class and each one of us individually to play a strategic role in bringing his love to the nations, the people of your community, to each and every one that we influence every day. We often hear how God has a future for us. Very common, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. In our study of the character of Moses, we see an amazing future offered to him by God. And I can hear a few santos coming out as God, as God gives this uh, promise to Moses. Exodus 33, 1, here's the future that God promised to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. That is a divine call. And go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. That's divine direction promised by God. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. That's divine victory. He said, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. That is divine abundance. Can you say, santo? That's a, that's a future promised 
to Moses by God. What an incredible future God was promising Moses. However, Moses had to break through some things to go to where God was calling him. He needed to break the regrets of the past. He needed to break the pathetic excuses of the present. And he needed, in order to get where God was calling him, he had to break through the paralyzing fear of the future. Yes, there is excitement in this room, especially in the first seven rows. But there is also great fear. And the fear of the future can paralyze you from trusting God for what he has for you. Fear of the future can paralyze us. I remember a, a student here, a youth ministry student who was youth pastoring as he was a student here. And he was so paralyzed by fear that he wouldn't do the right thing, that it wouldn't come off right. And he had an outreach planned, and he had hoped that there would be 60 people come to this outreach. They brought in a band. They were going to have a, a youth concert, and they were hoping for 60 people. And, and he came to me just almost paralyzed by fear. And I remember saying, Gary, you've done what you needed to do. You've promoted this. You've prayed. You've planned. Now trust the Lord. Well, that night, instead of 60, 600 students showed up to that. And more than 60, 70 or so made a life-changing decision for Christ that night. It's faith. Faith in the Lord. What is our answer for fear? It is just that. It's faith or trust. I learn a lot about trust when I look at my own children. Uh, they're growing up now. Yesterday, Josiah got his driver's license. That's scary right there. Today, he's driving all alone somewhere, somewhere. I need to get one of those cameras, I guess. So, but when they were little, especially, I was learning how I needed to trust my heavenly father. If I told you that I pierced my children's skin with a sharp metal object, or that I pulled out their teeth, you would say, what a horrible father. But my children learned to trust me, so that when they got a sliver in their finger and they said, Daddy, there's a sliver, I could take a pin and actually get that sliver out. That when they came up and said, Daddy, I have a loose tooth. I was like, here, I have a loose tooth. That I'd give them a piece of ice to suck on as long as they possibly could stand it. And then I'd say, I'm going to count to three, and on two, I would pull the tooth out. <laughs> they learned to trust me. Not because I was... I had some degree on the wall in uh, surgical removal of slivers or dental removal, but because I was their father. They had faith in me. 1 John 4, 18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. I remember we were in a circumstance where, where there was uh, potential danger at hand. And after that danger had passed, my daughter said to me, I was worried at first, but then I just looked at your face, Dad, and I knew everything was going to be okay because you weren't worried. If we would keep our eyes on the face of the Lord and let that faith cover our fear. Trust is when fear and faith collide. We can't trust until there are troubles. We can't see a miracle until we see the impossible. We can't be healed until we experience sickness and we can't be rescued until we are facing danger. Coming back to Moses, after God promised him all of the provision of these things, a divine call, direction, victory, and abundance, the last part of verse 3 of Exodus 33, God goes on to say, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard those distressing words, they began to mourn, Scripture says. They were worried. They were filled with fear. They heard all of these provisions, and yet God wasn't going with them. Moses' response to God was, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. It doesn't matter what kind of provision, what kind of direction, what kind of success it doesn't matter what kind of abundance I might experience in my life. If your presence, oh God, does not go with me, don't send me from Valley Forge Christian College. You see, Moses gets it. The only way to break the paralyzing fear of the future is to have faith in 
not your circumstances, not your provision, not your success, not your abundance, not even a sense of call. It's to have faith in Christ alone. Moses gets it. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. He goes on to say, I will do the very thing you have asked, Moses, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Seniors and all our friends gathered here at this baccalaureate service, let the Lord break in you today the paralyzing fear of the future and replace it with an ever-growing faith not in your abilities or your circumstances, not in your successes or provision, but in Christ alone. We recognize that the Lord needs to break some things in us. And you see three vessels up here that could represent our regrets, that could represent our excuses, that could represent our fear. But may you say with Moses, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. And with the psalmist, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Our prayer for you today is that you would allow God to break in you the painful regrets of the past. And allow forgiveness to cover those regrets. Our prayer for you is that you would allow the Lord to break in you the pathetic excuses of the present and cover those excuses with the freedom the Lord has for you. Our prayer for you today is that you would allow the Lord to break in you the paralyzing fear of the future and cover that fear with faith. Sometimes we hold on to our regrets because they're so pretty or our excuses because they're so respectful or our fears because they define us. And God wants to break that in us so that his will be done and his glory would be made known. Oh, how sweet the glorious message simple faith may claim. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. Still, he loves to save the sinful, heal the sick and lame, cheer the mourner, still the tempest. Glory to his name. Yesterday. Today. Forever. Jesus, Jesus is, is the, the same. same. All may change. But Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory, Glory to, to his, his name. name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus, Jesus never. Glory to his name. name. Those of us who are over 60 want to sing that song. <laughs> Thank you uh, to our speakers, our musicians this morning. And uh, as you would expect this afternoon, it'll be a little bit more formal with the uh, graduation 
events and the uh, presentation of degrees and so forth. And so uh, with our family in this setting, I just wanted to say one uh, additional word of appreciation. Dr. McLeod will be coming in just a moment and uh, we'll be sharing our benediction today and some instructions for the day. Uh, those of us who are a part of the Valley Forge family from day to day, uh, you guests, I wanted to uh, just share a word how grateful we are for Dr. McLeod's leadership for 20 years. He has served this institution about 18 and a half of those years as uh, academic vice president, more recent years as provost and vice president of academic affairs. And uh, I whispered to him as we were walking in the back, uh, I was less concerned about details this year again because of his familiarity and experience then perhaps I will be next year when we have a new person in uh, that chair but in God's providence leading uh, his life in ministry from here to uh, Chi Alpha Ministries and uh, those steps will be unfolding in a month or so and so we are all profoundly grateful and we've had opportunities of expressions of appreciation to him but if you wouldn't mind one more time as he comes for the benediction today let's express appreciation to Dr. McLeod. Thank you so much. Please remain standing. We'll pray in just a moment. Well, you know, we're up against a rather tricky weather forecast for this afternoon. The National Weather, for weather Service is predicting the potential of some pretty severe weather uh, in the area this afternoon. So we're trying to monitor that as closely as we can. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. We're going to be uh, meeting together to try to make a decision on the exact location of the uh, commencement service this afternoon. At this point in time, uh, we have prepared for an outdoor service, and we trust that that will be the case. But uh, if, uh, if the potential of severe weather and your safety is an issue, uh, we would move the service indoors, and we'd announce that ahead of time. So you would need to uh, have those tickets available, which you would need to have, and then we would have also space available in the overflow. Um, I do want to mention to you that regardless of where we are located this afternoon, uh, the service will be uh, webcast into Cardone Hall, and the classrooms there are open and available for you to view the service if for any reason you are unable to be either uh, out on the Green Lane Commons or here in the chapel. It is available in, in that regard for you. Uh, it is at 3 o'clock, so we would encourage you to uh, come and secure your, uh, your seats. You might want to speak with your graduate as to uh, the direction they're going to be walking in so that you can get a good view of them as they process in. Lunch will be served between 11.30 and 1.30 in the Dining Commons. Uh, some of you have already secured tickets. If you have not done so, you may purchase a ticket for lunch at the door. Uh, both cash and credit card are available for purchase of those tickets. I think that covers all the details. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the remainder of our day. Father, I thank you so much that you have impressed upon us today <clears throat> concerning our memories of yesterday, concerning the realities of today, and Lord, a vision for the future. I thank you for this wonderful representation in the presentation of the message today. I thank you for those that ministered in music today who touched our hearts and brought us near in your presence. And Lord, I pray that as we go about this day, that the spirit of this moment uh, would reside in the lives of these graduates, that they would know that deep sense of the presence of the Lord. Lord, that they would know that you are enveloping and encompassing their lives, and that you will lead and guide and direct every step of the way, and that where you do lead and guide, you will indeed provide. And Lord, I pray that as we move throughout the remainder of this day, that the joy and the celebration Lord, will just be exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think, and that we will enjoy these moments in your presence. Dismiss us now from this baccalaureate service. Bring us together again for commencement to give glory and honor and praise unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Amen.